Ellen Bohm, a single mother, was struggling with parenthood and the lack of support from her ex-husband in the late 1980s. She became a die-hard fan of professional wrestling in order to cope. Deanne, her best friend, met her at these matches. Deanne tried her hardest to be supportive and helpful to her friend, but when Ellen suffered two tragedies, Deanne became suspicious of her friend. This is the story of the children of St. Louis, Missouri, the Bones. Ellen Booker was born on June 9, 1960, in St. Louis, Missouri, and was raised by her mother, Catherine Booker. Her father was married with seven children when her mother met him. Her father quickly abandoned his family and moved in with Catherine. Ellen was born not long after. Her father, on the other hand, was an alcoholic who couldn't hold down a job. He was largely absent from Ellen's upbringing. Perhaps this is why Ellen was so easily swayed by older men's promises. She met Paul Bohm when she was 18 years old. Paul was much older and had served in Vietnam. He was a bus driver and he met young Ellen when she was a passenger. Paul was married with two children when he began dating Ellen. He soon divorced his wife and children and married Ellen. In 1980, the two used some inheritance money Ellen had and Paul's VA benefits to buy a house on Wyoming Street in St. Louis. Jennifer, the couple's daughter, was born in 1981. Stephen, their son, arrived in 1985. Ellen became pregnant again only a month after Stephen was born. She was struggling with motherhood's demands and felt her husband drifting away from her. To cope with her stress, she turned to her favorite hobby, watching professional wrestling matches. Despite Ellen and Paul's financial constraints, Ellen and her friend Deanne attended several local matches and even traveled to other cities. Paul dropped a bombshell on Ellen when she was eight months pregnant with the Bohm's third child. He told her that while serving in Vietnam, he was exposed to Agent Orange and needed immediate medical attention or he would die. He informed his wife that he had no choice but to travel to Texas for treatment. Shortly after leaving the family, he filed for divorce in order to marry a young lover he had left behind. He was not sick and had made that story up. Ellen gave birth to her third child, a son named David Brian Bohm, on July 25, 1986. Paul arrived at the hospital to see his son. According to relatives, he put on quite a show in order to persuade everyone that he was an excellent father to his children. Those who knew Paul, however, knew the reality. He fled a few days after David was born to marry his lover. David would never see him again. Ellen struggled financially and emotionally as a single mother with three young children. Her friends and family, on the other hand, saw no signs of abuse or neglect, and the children appeared to have all of their needs met. Ellen worked two jobs but struggled to pay her bills. Paul was supposed to pay child support to both Ellen and his first wife, but he never did. Ellen's house was foreclosed on, and she eventually declared bankruptcy. Despite her financial difficulties, Ellen remained a die-hard wrestling fan who frequently attended matches. She had even begun to write letters to some of the wrestlers, ostensibly in an attempt to begin a romantic relationship with one of them. Ellen appeared to be content with her life as a wrestling groupie. She would even spend money on her hobby that she needed for bills. She eventually relocated to an affordable housing apartment on South Broadway in St. Louis with her children. Ellen was facing mounting financial stress and must have been under tremendous pressure as Thanksgiving 1988 approached. On Thanksgiving Day, a friend called her and they talked about their plans for the holiday. Ellen hung up the phone, telling her friend that something was wrong with her two-year-old son David. Ellen quickly dialed 911 because David was unconscious, not breathing, and turning blue on the living room floor. When EMS arrived, they had to knock several times before anyone let them in. Ellen was not present when young Jennifer finally opened the door for them. Her daughter claimed to have gone downstairs. Paramedics began working on the toddler to stabilize him. Ellen reappeared as they were about to transfer him. David had been sick with a cold for a few days, according to her. Young David's resuscitation efforts were only partially successful, and he was placed on life support. However, 
After a few days, doctors informed Ellen that David had no brain activity and would never be removed from life support. They inquired as to what she desired to do. Her friend said she was calm and almost cold when she said, pull it, referring to turning off life support. David Brian Bohm died on November 26, 1988, when he was two years old. Ellen was making funeral arrangements for her son that evening when she spoke with her friend Deanne. She asked her friend if she wanted to go to a wrestling match in a few weeks at the Kiel Auditorium. Deanne found this odd, but concluded that everyone grieves differently, and Ellen was probably just trying to distract herself from the tragic loss of her baby. Her lack of tears and emotions, on the other hand, did not go unnoticed. Paul Bohm finally made contact with his mother-in-law the day after his son's funeral and learned of his son's death. Paul called Ellen, who informed him that David had died as a result of sudden infant death syndrome. SIDS are more common in children under the age of six months. Paul offered Ellen the opportunity to bury David for free at Jefferson Barracks funeral home by utilizing his military benefits, but Ellen declined. She buried him in LeMay's St. Trinity Cemetery. Ellen never paid for the funeral, which cost $2,348. Ellen had life insurance through her employer, which entailed a $5,000 payout in the event of her son's death. This was the first time Ellen had extra money in her adult life. This was the first time she was able to pay her expenses, take care of her kids, and indulge in her wrestling hobby. However, the money vanished quickly, leaving Ellen bankrupt once more. According to Ellen's friends, she dealt with David's death by going to wrestling matches and never seemed upset about it. She never cried or even mentioned David. Many people thought her behavior was strange, but everyone grieves in their own unique way. She spent her bereavement time traveling to out-of-town wrestling tournaments. She told a friend she wanted to marry a wrestler and lied about having sexual relations with wrestlers on several occasions. Ellen began looking for life insurance on Stephen and Jennifer in July 1989, eight months after David died. She purchased several policies for each of her children, totaling approximately $100,000 each. She was, however, broke and could barely pay her bills. She would not be able to pay the high premiums for the insurance policies for very long. Ellen was cooking and cleaning on September 13, 1989, while her eight-year-old daughter bathed. She was playing with her Barbie dolls when she was startled. A hair dryer had been thrown into the bathtub. The girl described the pain as excruciating, and she felt as if something was pulling her down in the tub. She was eventually able to unplug the hair dryer, which relieved the pain. Stephen, three, and Ellen, three, entered the bathroom after hearing her screams. Ellen inquired as to how the dryer got into the tub, but neither child had any idea. Ellen noticed blood dripping from her daughter's mouth and gathered the children to go to the emergency room. A neighbor also heard the screams and dialed 911. Ellen was rushing her children out of the apartment when the cops arrived. Her daughter would later claim that Ellen repeatedly told her and Stephen to tell the doctors and hospital staff that Stephen threw the hair dryer into the tub thinking she needed to dry the doll's hair. Ellen would later recount the incident at the hospital. Jennifer was treated and released from the hospital with minor injuries. It was deemed an accident. Ellen Bohm called 911 nine days later. Her four-year-old son, she claimed, was unresponsive. Ellen explained that she had taken Stephen to get his vaccines a few days before. She claimed he became ill after receiving the vaccines, and she discovered him unresponsive on September 25th. She had called in sick that day and informed co-workers that she had taken him to the doctor. She had not, in fact, taken the boy to the doctor that day. The same thing that happened to David is happening to Stephen, she also told a co-worker. Some of her co-workers were concerned about this. Stephen Bohm was declared dead at 3.45 p.m. on September 25, 1989. He had only recently celebrated his fourth birthday when he died. Ellen acted strangely detached and unemotional once more. Her friends couldn't shake the feeling that something was seriously wrong this time. Her friend Deanne alerted authorities to her suspicions, 
and an investigation into Stephen and David's deaths was launched. Dr. Michael Graham, a medical examiner, was also convinced that Stephen's death was suspicious. He thought Stephen had been suffocated. Sometimes the effects of smothering will show up in an autopsy, sometimes it won't. There are ways for a small child to be killed without the cause being revealed by scientific tests, the medical examiner explained. On a hunch, the medical examiner forwarded both boys' autopsy reports to several other pathologists for review. Paul Bohm learned of his son's death ten days after it occurred. He did not immediately return to St. Louis, but he did notify the police and child protective services about his ex-wife. Ellen walked into a car dealership less than a month after Stephen's death and purchased a brand new car. She had planned to receive more than $90,000 in life insurance, but due to the ongoing investigation, the insurance was not paid out immediately. The investigation was slow and took two years to complete. In the fall of 1991, the FBI advised local police on the best way to interview Ellen Bohm and elicit a confession from her. The deaths were caused by asphyxiation, according to the medical examiners who were consulted. With this information, police were prepared to apprehend Ellen Bohm for the murders of her two sons. She was arrested in September of 1991 and charged with two counts of murder. St. Louis police explained the evidence against Ellen and urged her to clear her conscience using FBI tips. When confronted in this manner, Ellen broke down and confessed completely. She then repeated the confession on videotape to be used at her trial. She knew it was wrong, but she was desperate for money, she explained. On Thanksgiving 1988, she put Stephen and Jennifer to bed but allowed David, then too, to stay up. She smothered him with a pillow from the couch. She did it again ten months later with Stephen. She also admitted to throwing the hair dryer into the bathtub to kill her daughter days before Stephen's murder. I threw a couch pillow over him. My hands were on both sides of the table. And he was extremely powerful. He did have some difficulty. And then I sat on that couch pillow for about 45 seconds at most. Then I replaced the pillow on the couch, and he was now lying on his back. And, I called my girlfriend, we talked about what each of us did for Thanksgiving, Ellen Bohm confessed to David's murder. Jennifer, Ellen Bohm's daughter, was placed in foster care. Her father sought custody, but his first ex-wife and others claimed he was unfit. He admitted to failing to pay child support, frequently being unemployed and homeless, and struggling to support his new wife's two young children. He claimed, however, that he received a monthly disability check and could support his daughter. Jennifer's current location is unknown because she was placed in the foster care system. Ellen Bohm, 31, was charged with two counts of first-degree murder and one count of attempted murder. She prepared for trial with the assistance of her public defender because she was unable to collect Stephen's life insurance. In this case, the prosecution intended to seek the death penalty. Ellen Bohm, on the other hand, accepted a plea deal with the prosecution a month before her trial was to begin in 1993. Ellen Bohm would not face the death penalty in exchange for pleading guilty to one count of first-degree murder and one count of second-degree murder. Instead, she was sentenced to one term of life in prison without parole and one term of life in prison with possible parole. Ellen Bohm will spend the rest of her life in the Missouri Department of Corrections. She is currently incarcerated at the Chillicothe Correctional Facility. What are your thoughts on the Ellen Bohm's case? I really appreciate your input. Thank you for taking the time to watch. Be a part of the Chris Crime Diaries family and hit the subscribe button now.